Hello everybody, welcome to our five part series on uh, the code is rigged. We're going to call it rigged. What's rigged against spray foam. We're going to get into five distinct videos that will cover five very important topics that we need to shed the light on. If you're new to this channel, my name is Mike. I'm the owner of Spray Jones and I'm the one producing the content on spray foam insulation to get your spray foam IQ up. And this is the kind of information that you can expect on this channel. So subscribe, like, comment. We like to have an interaction with our people. First video today is going to be on R values only. Why are R values such an important part of chiseled in stone status that we see with code compliance and we're going to show you how the R value is such a flawed measurement of uh, protecting a building and yet it takes on such a um, gigantus type uh, status in the building community. The second video we're going to do is going to be on air barriers and air leakages uh, and how that doesn't factor in properly into the code. In fact, the code contradicts itself on those factors. Uh, number three is going to be problems that the fibrous industry has written right into the code. So the code is actually written to solve problems for fibrous insulations that don't apply to others. Uh, so there are a lot of times making us jump through hoops that don't even really exist for us. Fourth is going to be why structural support and spray foam is not really considered how we should actually be building much of the structure that is built is allowances for uh, fibrous materials and insulation and airflow and vapor control and all these different things so structure changes when you're going with spray foam and the fifth video is going to be uh, where spray foam doesn't get mentioned okay so there's a lot of areas where the code hasn't even written that foam is an option and i'll give you an example like a lot of stuff for under slab and soil gas control those are some pretty interesting areas where we're just starting to emerge into the light on what closed cell foam can do compared to other uh, sheet products so today's video we are getting into why our our value alone are the bane of our existence and this is by far the biggest uh, problem elephant in the room that we face when when the R value compliance falls, and I, I hope that it will fall in my lifetime, I hope that at some point I can see this gremlin finally defeated because nothing has done more to confuse the consumer, confuse the building community, and actually guide the direction back towards the inferior products. Like it's it's an actual beard from the inferior products. And we're going to check this out. There's gonna be a sort of a sort of a heavy video today just on technical. So if you're not into technical stuff, you might just want to check out at this point. But if you have some courage, stick around. I'll try to keep this as short as possible while still landing some heavy Mike Tyson type punches. All right. David South produced this, I think this was about 2000, 2001. He put, produced this document and it just ripped through the spray foam community. Everybody's had it. The monolithic dome institute and the myth of R value. And he states here that the R value is one of the modern fairy tales of our day. It's this chiseled in stone status. The saddest part of the fairy tale is that the R value itself is almost a worthless number. I would agree. And the reason being is how it's calculated. All right. So let's scroll down to where he talks about R value, resistance value is used to determine K value. K value is an ASTM test that is testing uh, thermal conductivity. Uh, it says a major part of the problem lies in the design of the test. The test favors the fibrous insulation. So fiberglass, rock wool, and cellulose fiber, and very little input went into the test for solid insulation such as foam, glass, cork, and expanded polystyrene. I would agree with that, but stick around here. Okay, so here he states that the test does not account for air movement, wind, and the amount of moisture vapor. In other words, the test is used to create the R value or resistance value is a test of non-real world condi conditions. For instance, fiberglass is generally assigned an R value of approximately 3.5 for every inch. It would only achieve that value if tested in absolute zero wind and zero moisture movement. Zero wind and zero moisture movement are not real world. Agreed. Okay. But 
If you are doing an accurate, accurate, non-biased test for thermal conductivity, you do not want air movement because air movement is going to skew the results. You just want thermal conductivity. That means heat loss through touching. So they are getting this hyper-accurate, non-biased test for thermal conductivity. I don't have a problem with how it's set up per se. I have a problem with the fact that air movement, moisture movement, and all these other factors don't, don't relate into the code. This is where the code becomes rigged right so what they are doing is giving a perfect ideal number and then telling the consumer and the building people and of course the code people that if they have this one single number that they're good to go nothing could be further from the truth okay so he's going to talk about vapor barriers we're told very good reason that installation should have a vapor barrier on the warm side the warm side of the wall of the house which is the warm side obviously it changes from summer to winter even a day or night if it is 20 fahrenheit below zero outside when the sun is shining very obviously the warm side is the outside sometimes uh the novice will try to put vapor barriers on both sides of the insulation vapor barriers on both sides of fiber generally prove to be disastrous it seems that the vapor barriers will stop most of the moisture but not all that's because we're punching them full of holes right this accumulation beca can become a huge problem. We have re-insulated a number of potato storage buildings, which were originally insulated with fiberglass, having a poor vapor barrier on both sides. Within a year or two, the insulation became completely failed to insulate. The moisture would get trapped between the vapor barriers and saturate the fiberglass insulation to the point we're holding buckets of water. Fibrous insulation needs ventilation on one side. Therefore, the vapor barrier should go on the side where it will do the most good so we understand this with closed cell foam it doesn't matter the density of the product is the actual vapor permeance not just the skin on uh, the surface so whether it's uh, you're doing this for Florida Arizona Texas uh, Louisiana uh, you name it down in the States Mississippi right Georgia you're gonna want your vapor barriers on the exterior of the building because your your vapor drive is from out to in most of the time Whereas Montana, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, so on and so forth, the vapor drive is going to be from in to out. So with closed cell foam, you're always on the correct side. Code rarely recognizes that unless they're having specific regional codes written. So right away, code's rigged. doesn't explain a lot of times where things need to be. So air penetrating through fibrous insulations in an attic... And I've actually got an Oak Ridge National Laboratories uh, test report. We probably won't get into today. The video would be too long. But we sh we show that with air movement and high temperature outside, uh, extremely hot attic, uh, you lose 50%. It's like 49 to 52. And in some cases, 62% of the actual insulating value of the cellulose or the fiberglass is lost because the air becomes so hot, becomes a, a better conductor of heat than worse, and the heat loss picks up. So air movement going through insulation is detrimental, and it's going to reduce uh, the overall resistance value. The thermal conductivity is going to go higher. Again, thermal conductivity, R value, does not take any account for air movement, yet air movement has a massive, massive effect on the moisture movement and the insulation's ability to do its job. All right, so he's going to talk here that air penetration is a big deal. Fiberglass is used for air filter because it has a low impedance to airflow and it's cheap. In other words, airflow through it is very readily, uh, very readily is accessible. It is ironic how we wrap our house in a furnace filter that will strain out bugs and wind as it blows through the house. There are tremendous air currents that blow through the walls of a typical home. A demonstration holding a lit candle near an electrical outlet on outside wall when the air wind is blowing. The average home with all its doors and windows closed has a combination of air leakage equal to the size of an open door. Yes, we can get uh, homes to be fairly well sealed until we put the jip rock up. And I've gone through report after report, and we'll get into it when, when we do video number two on air barriers and air leakage, so we won't get into it here. We show you just how leaky uh, poly and air barriers are once the sheetrock is put up. And the, that is a huge problem for the code because the code mandates that these air barriers be installed to stop air leakage, yet as soon as the sheetrock is installed, they fail the very standard that they're needing. So the, the building code is mandating these things and they're not taking into account what is the trade-off. If you have air leakage, it pulls down your insulating value, your moisture levels go up. And so this needs to be factored in. We cannot reduce everything down to one number, which is just the R value. 
So it says here that our value tables are truly part of the fairy tale. They show a solid, show the solid and the fiber installation side by side, implying they can compare. The fact is, without taking installation conditions into account, comparisons are meaningless. Spray in place urethane foam provides its own vapor barrier, water barrier, wind barrier. None of the ins other insulations are as effective without special care at installation. The fiber insula insulations must be protected from wind, water, and vapor. Again, the tables need a second table to state installation conditions. And with fibrous, unless you're going to have physical contact with all six sides, top, bottom, front, back, left, right, all that, all six sides need contact. When you do not have physical contact on all six sides, the the effectiveness is going to go down. You scrunch it, it's going to go down, right? So you can lose 30% of your insulating ability just on installation anomalies. There is a substantial difference between insulation for temperature control and insulation for heat loss. For instance, the graph below shows the heat loss control of spray in place urethane foam insulation. Any insulation will have a similar graph, but the thicker amount with the but with thicker amounts of insulation. This graph points out that more insulation is not necessarily cost effective. There's a point where more insulation is pointless from a total heat loss perspective. So here we're going to see uh one inch two inch three four five and go on and so on and so forth and the surface temperature inside is rising and the heat loss has flattened out at just over the two inch mark so when we get to three and four and i've showed you this before in how much foam do i need video that once we get to the third inch any every inch after the third is throwing our money away because we're not we're not doing drastic increases in surface temperature so you can keep adding so these people that say you need to have six or seven inches of foam is adding cost massive cost and this is where we get into the, the system is rigged so if we're just going to hit a, a white paper prescriptive number which is going to require five six seven or eight inches of closed cell or open cell foam we're flattening out the actual heat loss and the surface temperature is not going to gain inside the building drastically Okay. The graph shows that 70% of heat loss from conductance is stopped by a one inch thickness of spray in place urethane foam. Remember that we're only going to stop nearly 100% of the heat loss from air infiltration with the first one fourth of an inch. So a quarter of an inch will stop the air infiltration. One quarter of an inch of foam will stop air infiltration. The second inch of spray in place urethane stops 90 percent of the heat loss and a third inch 95 so you're going to go from 90 to 95 five percent gain taking it up to three inches thermal diffusivity and heat sinks it should be noted that when the urethane is used on the exterior of a heat sink such as concrete the actual effect of our value is approximately doubled do you think that factors into the code no this is why with monolithic dome, we are able to calculate effective R values in excess of 60. A heat sink is any substance capable of storing large amounts of heat. Most commonly, we think of concrete, brick, water, adobe, and earth as heat sink materials used in building. The property of a heat sink is to act as an insulation is called thermal diffusivity. So this is really good for under slab uh we don't just have to hit prescriptive white paper value on how much insulation the slab itself sitting on top of the foam you go out and put two inches of closed cell foam down onto the gravel and then pour the concrete on top of it he's telling you you have got a doubling effect of the actual insulation's ability to do its job with the slab on top of the floor Surface temperature control is the second reason for insulation. In many cases, it is the most important reason for the insulation. I noticed this phenomenon while insulating potato storage. Uh, we had various customers ask us to insulate the buildings anywhere from two to five inches of foam. The buildings insulated with two inches would hold the temperature of the potatoes properly, just as well as the buildings insulated with five inches. The difference came in condensation. Potato storage are kept at a very high humidity level. The buildings with two inches of urethane foam would have far more condensation than those with the five inches and this is simple i've shown you charts you can download these charts at any time off the internet that when your humidity levels rise it takes far less gradient 
between surface temperature and air temperature. So if the surface temperature of the spray foam can get cool enough at a high enough humidity level, it will condense. So what he's telling you here is if you're going to have excessively high elevated humidity levels, we're talking well over 85%, probably into the 90% range, right? Very, very wet interior temperatures. You're going to need a very high insulation value to make sure that the inner surface temperature of that insulation stays warm enough that it cannot form a drip. And this is exactly why we have this problem with the flash and back crowd. What needs to happen in closing with this video is that the evidence is out there that the spray foam performs extremely well. Air tightness, moisture movement, adhesion, the fact that we can insulate the outside of a slab, underneath the slab. We can do a lot of things that the fibrous products cannot. So therefore, the actual thermal performance of slabs, foundation walls, joist stands, air leakage, vaulted ceilings is going to be incredibly better with spray foam than it will be with conventional old-fashioned products. Therefore, we do not need to hit higher prescriptive requirements for the other inferior products. So the code needs to be a multi-tiered system. It needs to be looking at uh, fibrous insulations, cellulose insulations, board stock insulations, and then spray. And spray would be at the top tier. And then board stock would be underneath it. And then finally, your lowest level would be uh, your mineral fiber, cellulose, and finally at the absolute bottom would be glass fiber. And and needing sheet products, vapor barriers, and all sorts of other things, house wraps, in order for those products to be compliant. So that's another thing. There would be far more um, anecdotal and auxiliary products that would need to be incorporated with the lower tier products in order to make them work. Right now, compliance for code is very lax when it comes to these products. So people would get way more frustrated trying to use them, the cost would go up, and then they would start to search out and find alternative solutions, better solutions. Right now, they're able to select these inferior products because the code allows it and it lets them get away with it. So to wrap up in what we are looking at as to why the code is actually rigged for fibrous is that it doesn't take into account the proper air leakage and water movement and installation issues with code compliance on insulating values. The sole uh, prescriptive requirement of our value is absolutely outdated. It's over 50 years old in its technology base. So what we need to go to is a multi-tier system where you choose your insulation and therefore the prescriptive requirements for your structure would change as to how much of that given product you need to use. You say, okay, you're using spray foam. It would uh, put out a number. You can get a, a code compliance with just two inches of closed cell foam, uh, five inches of open cell foam, or if you're going to use fibrous insulation, you're going to need 12 or 14 inches to be uh, compliant. Once they tier the systems and go away from the R value only test, air movement, uh, water movement, and installation methods, I think you'd see a dramatic shift in how buildings are designed, what products they're called for and required. So right now the code is largely rigged for this outdated method of judging all insulations based on one uh, method, which is resistance value, and air goes through it, water goes through it, and it has a huge problem with how it's going to be installed from one to the next. So I think that more or less sums up. And we're going to get into video two. We're going to get into air barriers, air leakage, and obviously vapor. And we're going to show you just how ridiculous and contradictory uh, the code is on its own standards. So stay tuned for that video. That video is really going to flush it out uh, well. So comment, like, and subscribe. Thank you for uh, sticking it out this far if you have, and we'll see you on video number two.